Welcome to this video on the central limit theorem and how it is useful. It may take a little bit because it's a little complicated, but we'll go through a couple of examples. So imagine you have a population, and from that population you know the mean and the standard deviation. If you were to take a sample from the population, in theory, the average of your sample should be the average of your population. There's no guarantee that's true, but that's the theory. And we're going to use that, and then we'll explain why. So, an example here. If the average age of 10,000 students is 24, with a standard deviation of 2, and you were to take a random sample of 50 students, you would expect the average of the sample of 50 students to also be 24. So this is what it means. Down here, this is the population average, the population mean. Over here, this is the mean of the samples. Okay. So you expect those to be the same. That's the notation. Why? Well, if Jim took 50 students and got their average, Bill took 50 students and got their average. Let's say 20 people do this, so we get 20 averages. Maybe nobody has exactly 24, but if we took all those and averaged them together, we'd expect to get closer and closer. So the idea is that the more samples you take, the closer that would get you to the mean. So in general, all the outliers are being taken out because if Bill has older people, his average may be a little high, but then everybody else's should be closer to the mean and drop his down. So the average um, here of samples would be close to the average of the population. Sometimes this is referred to as the mean of the means over here. talk about calculating standard deviation. Since we would have several sample averages and that's what we're working with, we expect those averages to be closer to the actual population average. So therefore they're not spread out as much. And here um, the larger the population, excuse me, the larger the sample size, the closer it would be to that population mean. So here's the notation our regular population standard deviation, our sample size, and over here the standard deviation of the means. Okay. So calculating that from the previous example, the mean is 24, the standard deviation is 2, the sample size is 50. Um, previously we would say that the mean of the samples is 24 and the standard deviation of the sample averages is from this calculation 0.283, much less than 2. So the purpose here will be to calculate distributions and probability from the average of samples. Okay. So from this example, same information as before, but we say what's the probability that the mean of the sample would be less than 24.5? So, if we took 50 people and averaged their age, the question is, what's the probability that, that average age is less than 24.5? And here's the notation. This right here, of course, is a sample mean, less than 24.5. The z-score formula looks a little bit more complicated. Okay, but we just went over what everything here stands for. Once again, we have all the information here, so we're going to calculate a z-score. And this z is going to represent um, from sample means. But the z-score is 1.77. We look this up in our table and it gives us 0.9616. This means that if you took a random sample of 50 students, there's a 96% chance that the average of the sample would be less than 24.5. Now that is very different than if you took one student and have the likelihood of him being less than 24 and a half. Okay, very different. 
because here you're taking 50 and the average should come back to the population average. It's a very different meaning. So the good news here is that as long as you understand how to adjust the formula, everything you've learned about z-scores in the previous sections work the same. That means whether or not it's a left tail or right tail, whether or not you have to subtract from one, or even if you have to work backwards from a percentage to a z-score or from a z-score to a data mean in this case. Okay, so all that stuff still carries. So another example here, since it can be a little confusing, it says a lake contains fish that have an average length of 14 inches. The standard deviation is 3.5 inches. If Bob catches 20 fish from the lake, what is the probability that the average length of his fish will be more than 15.5 inches? Okay. So the idea here is that with 20 fish and using the average, that's going to change the standard deviation in the way that it works. Okay. But the idea here is that his average would be more than 15.5, and everything comes into play here. So what they gave us was a population mean of 14, a population standard deviation of 3.5. He's going to take a sample of 20, and he's comparing all this to a sample mean of 15.5. Okay, so playing all this in, uh, in the appropriate spot, we know that the mean of the means is 14, going through the standard deviation formula here. We're going to use for the standard deviation 0.783. Okay. Notice that the sample size impacts that greatly. And then using the z-score, comparing 15.5 to 14, we get a z-score of 1.92. And if we look that up in the table, 1.92 says that there is 0.9726 to the left of 15.5. So we want to see what the probability of his fish being greater than 15.5. So we're going to subtract that from 1 and get 0 0.0274. This means that the probability of his average fish being longer than 15.5 is 0 0.2, excuse me, 0 0.0274. So he's got less than a 3% chance of the average of those 20 fish being more than 15 and a half inches.